Welcome to the More Perfect Union, the podcast that offers real debate without the hate. I'm Kevin Kelton. Greg Matusek and Ward Anderson could not make it tonight, but uh, I'm here and ready to rock and roll with uh, our regular Joe Seart. Hi, Joe. How's it going, Kevin? Mark Rappaport, who's been with us before. Hi, Mark. Good to see you, Kevin. And joining us for the first time and very excited to have her on, Jennifer Peterson. Hi, Jennifer. Hey. So Jennifer is an award-winning producer, writer, and director, and an alumni of the prestigious American Film Institute's Directing Workshop for Women program, and is a uh, a host of a popular animal welfare podcast called And Justice for Animals. So Jennifer, first of all, tell us a little bit about that podcast, because that sounds kind of interesting to me. Well, thank you for asking, and thank you for having me. I started this podcast a couple of years ago. I have a great love for animal rescue and just bringing attention to animal welfare issues out to the public. I've been vegan for about 10 years. That happened once I adopted my dog after a kind of rough divorce. And I just, my my, uh, journey with working with animals, helping animals and working with rescues kind of started from there. And it just felt like the natural next step for me would be to start my own podcast. And I've had wonderful guests on and we continue to do great shows. Just had Captain Paul Watson on from Whale Wars and we talked about his work. So it's just just a great passion of mine. Great. Well, this is going to be a little awkward because I actually eat dogs. Wow. Yeah, yeah. that's wrong. That's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. No, my doctor said I've got to get some more canine on my diet. So um (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, obviously, it's a wonderful program that you that you organize. <laughs> Thanks. And, Thank uh, you so much. <laughs> and, Don't and eat Mark, dogs. Mark, can, well, can you follow that? Well, I'll jump in here, at Kevin, as you know, because you've come over here and I've subjected you <laughs> to my diet. Um, I'm actually a vegan, too. What do you think? Mark, Mark. Uh, I love it. Well, Only about a year and a half. I fell off the wagon once. I didn't really fall off the wagon, but when I traveled in, I just went to France and Costa Rica, and it's almost impossible to be 100% vegan. So I must admit, I'm asking for forgiveness from the vegan vegan, uh, police or the vegan (laughs) gods. Please, I I did eat some non-vegan things, um, but uh, as soon as I came home and then controlled my diet, and Kevin actually stayed with me and I subjected him to my diet. (laughs) It's not that bad, right? I fed you good stuff. Uh, oh, we ate like kings. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's the thing. That's the thing. Now it's, you know, 10 years ago, being a vegan was a lot harder than it is now. Now there's just so many great companies making fabulous product and also just, I mean, it's just healthier for you. And I think we're all after two years of COVID realize how important our health is to us. And um, of course I'm vegan for the animals, but I always say whatever gets you there, gets you there. And even okay. if you can just do it, you know, once a week. What is that website and or Instagram handle that you want to put out there for people to check it out? Uh, and justice for is my, the website where they can listen to all the episodes or you can find and justice for animals on iTunes or any podcast provider. Right. And Joe, you're still working to find rescue homes for uh, professional wrestlers, right? I was about to say it's WrestleMania weekend. And I'm surprised that's not the staged combat that I'm ready to talk about tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about a little staged combat. Will Smith apparently resigned from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences uh, this evening, getting ahead of the Academy, which was uh, weighing how to discipline him. Uh, I have my thoughts on that, but I'm going to throw it open to the gang first and see what do you guys think about Mr. Smith's latest attempt at redeeming himself? I was actually very pleased that he did that. Um, I think it was the right thing for him to do. And he's, this is the first step of the apology tour. Whenever a celebrity or anybody does something, they go on the apology tour. Michael Richards did it. Every, everybody who does something incredibly stupid does this. And this is the first stage having dealt with publicists and everything. It's so, it's so obvious that they all got together the publicists and the lawyers. And they just said, Okay, these are your choices. This is Mm -hmm. what you're going to do. So I'm glad he did it. It just saves everybody from kicking him out. (laughs) And um, it's the right thing. And, you know, Kevin had some thoughts about whether they should take uh, his Oscar away. And I'm going to get to that. 
We'll get to that. Yeah. Uh, Jen, I want to ask you what you think about uh, his resignation. And I say that with uh, with quotes around the word. Yeah, I mean, just what Mark said. I mean, I mean, it was inevitable. He was going to have to do that for sure. That that is like the. the but what does that do? I mean, it, uh, so he can't vote now and uh, it takes the screeners away from him. And a few other things, a few other perks, but he can still be nominated for best actor. So I don't know if they'll put the kibosh on that for a while. I don't know. But I think, it, you know, to me, it was what happened last week. It was a week ago, right? I mean, I have lost all sense of time. Since Almost a week that. ago. Yes. Yeah. I knew, you know, deep down, I knew that if Will Smith, if, if, if anyone was up there, like if Amy Schumer had said that line, he wouldn't have gone up there and slapped Amy. If um, The Rock was up there, not Chris Rock, but The Rock was up there, he wouldn't have gone there and slapped The Rock. It felt like it felt so bullying to me. It felt that he knew that he was just going to go up there and smack this guy who's smaller framed. And yes, he's a comedian. And comedians should have some sort of protection up there. It also just bothered me. There was no security. I was like, where the heck is security? Um, so much of it bothered me. So that's the least he can do. I'm going to no? jump in because yeah. I'm going to be the outcast on this one or the outlier, I should say, hopefully not outcast. But uh, I, w- I actually wasn't too thrilled to hear this news. I actually think it was, and I'm going to use a word I don't like to use on the show. I thought it was a dick move because I think the the logic there, and who knows what his publicity people, how they strategize this. But to me, when I heard that, the logic was, I will preempt them kicking me out. I I will resign. And so they can't kick me out of the Academy because I resign. Because I've done it. Yeah. It's like, who? first of all, the Academy Board of Governors, I think that's what they call themselves, Mm -hmm. has a very difficult position that they have to work through, which is having not ejected him from the event, Mm-hmm. And we'll talk about taking away the Oscar. I don't think that's going to happen. We'll we'll, we'll talk to, about that in more detail. But short of the you know, the smaller reaction, which would have been uh, ejecting him right there, or the giant reaction, which is taking away the Oscar, they have to have an action. And their only action that they can take would have been to suspend him. And mm-hmm. he just preempted them from doing that, which makes them look even wimpier. So. I'm going to go out on a limb and say it was not a um, an honorable thing to do. It was just the opposite, and I think it makes him look like even more of a you know what. Well, I didn't say on. I didn't say honorable. I just felt like having watched this guy before. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm not a huge Will Smith fan. I'm just not. I haven't been for years because of just how I've seen them with you know always putting their kids out and things and like the you know they're, they're always seeking publicity. It's like constant, and so I just got kind of turned off years ago. So, so his move, that post he did the next day, felt like a publicist had written it. Oh, of his course. Speech, his speech was brutal at the awards. Like I thought that was just. It was brutal. And just listening to it, it felt so insincere. And uh, I mean, every part about it was just gross. And so I agree with you. Yeah. You know what okay. Smith reminded me of? I don't know whether anybody else has made this uh, observation in, in, in the media, but his acceptance speech reminded me of the Brett Kavanaugh hearings mm-hmm. when Kavanaugh broke down and started crying. Uh, brutal, too. That was yeah, awful. Yeah. Oh. Because and, and Mark and I watched this together. We just happened to be in L.A. at the same time. So we were watching the Oscars and I could I could see the wheels spinning in his head when he was vamping that acceptance speech. Mm-hmm. All that bullshit about, you know, protecting his family. And and this is what Richard uh, Williams, you know, this is the kind of man he was. It was just such an obvious attempt to talk his way out of what had happened Mm-hmm. That it just made it worse. And the crying, if nothing else, he'll never live down that accepted speech. And I'm just I'm going to throw to you uh, in a second, Joe. I, I know I'm not the first person to say this, but the fact that the Academy stood and gave him an ovation Brutal. just makes it all the more worse. And and there are people who have mm-hmm. come out and said, I don't know what I was thinking in the moment you do it because everybody else is. But mm-hmm. now a lot of people feel badly that that's how they responded. Joe? Now, when I first saw this happen, to me, it almost seemed like Will Smith response to himself becoming a meme since he did that interview with his wife a few years ago. And on the whole, he has been looked at as less like the whole meme is about, you know, your wife telling you this thing and you being like, yeah, that's cool. And it felt like this was a move to save face, because even if you compare 
the Chris Rock joke to a couple of years ago when Jada and Will boycotted the awards. And his joke then was, it's like me complaining about not getting in Rihanna's panties. I wasn't invited. Yeah. That, on the face of it, much more angering joke, I would think, than G.I. Jane 2. Can't wait to see it. You know, a quick joke. One of the other things that just, oh my God, so many things bother me about it. But, but comedian Tiffany Haddish coming out. And Tiffany Haddish saying, oh, God, you know, I don't think I've ever seen anything more romantic in my life. <laughs> and I was wow. like, you need you need to date more, girl. Like, you need to get out there because that is not romance. That is not romance. And I was so bothered by that. I thought, you know, you're just you're just going to jump in there and support Will when Chris Rock's up there being really classy and dignified and keeping the show together. Because if he if he had reacted and he had done anything but what he had done, that show that show was falling apart. I mean, if you listen to the producer now, he talks about how it was like throwing cement in the room. The room froze. So Chris Rock, he kept, you know, he kept it going. And I have a lot of respect for him uh, for doing that because that he must have been in absolute shock. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, I want to I want to add to that. I totally agree with what you just said. I also and I told this to Mark when in the moment I, I throw a big shout out of, of respect to Sean Combs. Because he also helped get things back on their feet. You know, when it first happened, I kind of took a let's wait and see kind of an approach. I didn't want to start throwing daggers at any one person because they are human beings and human beings are fallible. And I figure there must have been a lot of stuff that was going on behind the scenes in the, in the Smith family that, that made him do what he did. But over the week, as I started to see people talk about how chivalrous his action was, and it was anything but that. But secondly, people who were coming down on Chris Rock for having behaved badly or being a bad comic or all of these other things, when in fact, all he was doing was doing his job. Mm-hmm. And as I, I said to some of my, my Facebook friends who disagreed with me on this, as an audience, we only get to respond to a joke three ways. You either laugh, you don't laugh, or you walk out of the room. But we don't get to edit the material. We don't get to say, oh, that was a weak joke. He shouldn't have made it. Or you don't make fun of people's family or you don't make fun of a woman's hair. God forbid anyone should make fun of a woman's hair that they're so sensitive about. That is all, in my opinion, and, uh, you know, your mileage may vary. That's all bullshit. It's, It's socialization that we should have done away with at least 20 years ago. Chris Rock had every right to make a joke about her. Because people people have said this. They said, well, it's not a roast. Yes, it is. That's exactly what being a comic at the Oscars is. It's a roast. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, Amy Schumer came out and did some great zingers. Yeah. yeah. And no one went up and slapped her in the face. You know, I mean, you can go back through the years and find other comics who have either hosted or done presentations at the Oscars who've been much more cutthroat on the audience than Chris was. Yeah. Before we get off this topic, I do want to ask you guys what you think of the suggestion that's been out there that some people believe uh, Mr. Smith's Oscar should be taken away from him. I can separate the artist from that that bad act. I mean, I think that if they're going to remove, I don't think they're going to, first of all. I just don't think they will, because I think Harvey Weinstein has all of his still. I think Roman Polanski has his. So if you're going to start, you know, removing Oscars from people who act poorly, um, I mean, I wouldn't mind seeing Harvey Weinstein have all of his Oscars removed, but I don't think that's going to happen. So um, I liked his <laughs> I liked his performance. I mean, I did. That's what that's what depressed me. I mean, I thought King Richard was a good film and I thought his performance was one of the best of the year. And when I saw his behavior, I just was like, oh, dang. You blew, you blew that opportunity. I mean, it's sad. So I don't, I don't think they'll take it away. I really don't. I think they'll do, I think they'll do other stuff, but I don't think they'll take it away. I don't think they should, because I mean, he won it for the performance. Like you can face consequences for your actions, but I don't know if losing the award for the art that you put out there should be part of that. I mean, Miss America, you know, got dethroned for having naked pictures in in a magazine. So you can decide, well, was that right? That's an interesting memory, Mark. I I, I forgot about that whole, well, it, 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 it's, it, it helped her career, actually. <laughs> yes. Well, the thing is, if you take it away, then then it becomes, 
I, I mean, I, I think they shouldn't take it away just because it's going to give him more, you know, martyrdom. Right. Um, and I think the best thing to do at this point is just like what, what we should probably do is like this be done. I think we've kind of all said what we need to do. So, OK, so I agree with pretty much everything you guys said. I also do not think that the Academy should take away his award, which was one for, you know, so work that was done for a couple of years. It's an award for the Williams sisters as well. That's their father that was portrayed on stage. And they gave Will Smith permission to, you know, use their father's life. I feel very bad for them, by the way. I think that they're also victims in this whole thing. But regardless of what we think should happen with the award, to those people who may disagree with us out there, and you think it would be a fitting punishment for him to lose his Oscar, here's why that won't happen. Because any movie that wins an Oscar, especially a Best Actor or Best Actress Oscar or a Best Picture Oscar, but any of those top awards, they're worth tens of millions of dollars in box office receipts after the Oscars and after that publicity. They will use in their advertising Best Actor winner. Mm. And if, if the Academy were to take away that award, Warner Brothers, who distributed the film, and the three production companies that produced it. Now, one of them is probably owned by Smith. I don't. I didn't look into that, but there were at least three different production entities listed in the credits. They would have standing for quite a lawsuit. And I don't think that the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences wants to be on the handle for thirty, fifty, a hundred million dollars in legal restitution. So, and, and by the way. Warner Brothers and the other producers would have a hell of a case because, as you pointed out, Jennifer, they never took away Harvey Weinstein's. They never took away Roman Polanski's. And also because on some level, even though I'm here certainly defending Chris Rock, not that he needs any defending, but in a court of law, the attorneys for the plaintiffs, which would be the Warner Brothers and the other producers, would say, you know, on some level, the Academy was negligent because that was their presenter out there and he instigated the whole situation. So I certainly would not want to be an attorney trying to defend that case. Mm -mm. Good point. I hadn't even thought of that. That's true. Moving on, that little war in, in Ukraine, has anybody heard about that? Is that still going on? Oh, indeed it is. It's awful. Yes. So, Joe, it's it's sort of like a WWE SmackDown right now, except the underdog is winning. Yeah, it's very surprising. I mean, we had brought up in the rundown about they're kind of going to conscript soldiers now. And it seems like if you're already not doing well in this war, the last thing you would want fighting for you is guys that might not necessarily want to or be trained well yeah you know what else is it a good look if if russia has to draft or not draft but uh recruit syrian militia guys <laughs> to come and fight for their side that's really bad if you have to bring in armed forces from outside of your army and outside of your country to help you buttress your defense or your attack yeah there was a news story that um that putin is getting misinformation or bad information from his uh, advisors and defense people. Did you guys hear about this? Mm, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. (laughs) Let's put it that way. What uh, Putin has fallen into is what they call the the, the dictator's dilemma, I think. I I don't know what the exact name of it. And every dictator falls into that, that when you, the more powerful you get, the more you surround yourself with people who are only going to say yes to you because the people say no, get killed, get thrown into gulags, get get marginalized. So either you only get people who will say yes to you or anybody who is around you is going to learn to say yes or either leave or be eliminated. And so at one point, you, you don't get the best people. Mm-hmm. And when you don't get the best people, you deteriorate. And historians are that much more educated than me have gone through and looked at almost every fallen dictator. And they all fall into the same pattern where they get to a certain point 
that they're so powerful that they only get yes people around them and people who never say, hey, that's a bad idea. Don't do that. Don't do that. And you can look at leader after leader after leader. And I'll just say with, I think the exception of Stalin, for some reason, had was able to not, not be deposed. But virtually all of the other ones have fallen into that. And, and there's a, a name for it. I think it's called the dictator dilemma or the dictator paradox or something. I think like it is that. the dictator dilemma. Yeah. So it's not surprising. And it's not surprising that, that it happened so quickly. Yeah. So I agree with that. But I also have, I always, whenever I read these things, I, my mind just works where I try to think, well, what else is behind this story? What aren't they telling us? And it occurred to me that, you know, he probably is getting bad information. Listen, it's obvious he's getting bad information or he wouldn't have done what he did and and find himself six weeks in <laughs> losing to a smaller a country. Mm-hmm. But I think that there's more behind the fact this was a big story on the news on CNN and MSNBC yesterday. I mean, a big story. They ran it every hour on the hour. And it occurred to me, if you were the Biden administration and you wanted to screw with your opponent's head, what would be a more devious way of screwing with his head than to plant the idea in his head that he can't trust the people around him and that he's getting bad information from the people around him? Because there's no way to test that. There's no way for Putin to figure out whether he is getting good information from his advisors. <laughs> so I think it's a it's what they call a psyops operation. I think they're they're effing with them. Who do you think they the are? the Biden administration? Oh, so I think, you think it's the Biden administration? I think they think. leaked that story. I mean, I know they did. It came out of the the State Department. It came from a, a statement from the State Department, and I think that they leaked it to the media, knowing the media was going to run with it. I don't know whether the media is complicit or not. But I think that they wanted that idea to somehow get into Putin's head. But aren't we afraid of making this guy <laughs> any more unsteady well, and angry as far as nu- nuclear warheads go? I mean, aren't we aren't we isn't that one of the reasons we have been we have. Well, there's many reasons why we haven't you know gotten involved in any sending troops or anything, which we will never do, I hope. But isn't aren't we trying to keep this guy a little from completely losing it? That is a great question. And uh, my answer to you is, yes, I do believe that they spend a lot of time every single day trying to figure out how far they can push without pushing him too far. Uh However, I don't think that this falls into that category. I think that they want him to be off balance because ultimately, I think they're hoping, as I think most people are hoping, that he is going to, on some level, have to back off, withdraw find a, a an off ramp to use the, the word of the, the year, the cliche of the year, uh, that he can pretend that he won somehow. But I think in the midst of the battle, making him distrust his, his generals and distrust his defense people, and then maybe jail a few of them or kill a few of them, which makes him even more vulnerable. I think that the United States would be safe in doing that without tipping him too far. Uh, the, the U.S. government has done something analogous to that. So uh, the FBI, when they're trying to break up the mob, which is the same kind of thing. I mean, basically, Putin's a mobster. Mm -hmm. So they're using the same techniques where they go and they say, you know what? Somebody in your organization (laughs) is riding on you. And they would have the organization eat itself from within side until there was enough pressure. Either somebody cracked and came to the government or somebody took the guy down and if you look at, I mean, you, you just have to look at any Martin Scorsese movie. I think they. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of many right now. You're absolutely right. right. Mm-hmm. Goodfellas, Casino, they're all the same thing. Where the it's always the FBI planting that thing, like, oh, you know, I don't know if you can trust all your guys, and then they start turning on each other. So, um, ah. Kevin, I think you're. A hundred percent right. Kevin, I think you're on to something. I think that is what was done. And I think that's what our country does do. And if you think about it, it's a pretty good way of disabling your enemy. I mean, you you know, you you might think, you know, our our government's incompetent, but in some ways we do some things pretty good. (laughs) It's an interesting way to slap someone, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Joe, you had a thought. I think it is part maybe us feeding misinformation to him. But if you also look at him, hasn't he been trying to produce a certain narrative and he's been trying to change the truth. So yeah, when you yeah. inherently in like affect the way that you're presenting truth, you're already working on a misinformation paranoia level. And it's not hard 
to just, you know, tip off that paranoia and be like, I don't know, man. Like I heard somebody in your group say you guys don't have it. And then when you're losing the war, you're like, who said that? They obviously had to say it because we don't have it. And then like Mark said, this, the organism kind of eats itself from there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So one other thing I wanted to bring up, and again, this was in the news yesterday. Maybe you guys heard about it. There was some organization that did a poll in Russia to see what Putin's popularity is this week, as opposed to before the war. And according to the poll numbers, his popularity was actually up. His support amongst Russians was actually up. And when I first read that headline, I thought, well, that's kind of bizarre and kind of sad that the Russian people are actually rallying around this guy when he's clearly, you know, a horribly violent and murderous tyrant. But then it occurred to me, the way you do polls is you call people out of the blue. They don't know who you are. Who would answer their phone in Russia with a stranger (laughs) calling and saying, I got a couple of questions for you. First of all, do you support or do you not support Vladimir Putin? Who would answer that in oh, the affirmative? 100% support. 100%. 100%. <laughs> that was- What's probably happening with that poll, and I have a little firsthand experience, uh, knowledge of this, is that the people who are, are, are not in favor of the government have left. They've gotten on planes, they've gotten in their cars, and they've literally left the country. That's right. Um, and I do have a little firsthand, I mean, I have anecdotal because I don't, didn't do a survey, but I know somebody, and I know actually more than somebody, I know a number of people personally who have left the country. So I think they're asking people who've stayed there. And the ones who've stayed there um, stay there because they either believe, like they truly believe, they want to believe because they've chosen to stay there and they don't have another place to go. So they you, you get into this thing, well, I got to believe it because I'm here or what Kevin said. So it can be any one of those answers. That poll, in my opinion, is just garbage. It's yeah. total. Nothing. Absolutely. It means, I think that, I think that it means nothing that the people who are there, the people are there truly believe in what they're doing, uh, what he's doing. And because they've, they've bought into, we are, we've chosen to stay here or we don't have another place to go. We're getting on board with this. And you have to do that psychologically it's a it's in a, it's a bit of a Stockholm syndrome, um, and it's a bit of survival, and it's a bit of the way people who've grown up in that system have learned to survive by just buying into it. At one point, you just give up and say, you know, I love Big Brother. You know, at the end, remember at the end of the book, I love Big Brother. You, at one point, you just give up and you give in and you truly put your heart in it because that is your land. You don't have another choice. You can't stand there and be pessimistic and, and mm. happy all the time. So when I hear a poll like that, uh, again, I just think it's, you know, complete nonsense. It makes a good headline. It's, it's something that, you know, you can put in the, the, the news. There's reasons for that particular, you know, that uh, result in that poll. That's I think if they'd had him at like 37 or 47% or something, I might've bought it, but it was like an 80. I mean, it was at some ridiculous it number. Was, that, it was well over 70%. I was well over, over. Well well over. over. I was like, oh, I mean, have we ever had any leadership that had numbers like that? I mean, never. So why did how does Putin have these numbers? And then to your point, Kevin, that's probably how he has the numbers. No one wants to say who's going to who's going to who's going to say. I mean, it's so, so true. So let me ask you this, because the, it, it, the follow up question is the four of us saw through this in a matter of moments. Why did the New York Times report it as hard news and spend two or three columns analyzing why his popularity has gone up? Hmm. You would think that they would be the ones to point out this has been reported, but it really should be taken with about half a half a ton of salt. You know what they'll do? Their follow up story will be about how they misjudged it. So they haven't. (laughs) We have to send we just have to send them this episode and help them out or they just need to hire us to (laughs) tell them what they're writing. I don't know. All I can say is the New York Times is not the New York Times that we we used to revere. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It is not the it's not the paper we used to revere. Mm -mm. So so using that as a segue to talk about media and eventually some fun media and entertainment. Did you guys hear that Jen Psaki is rumored to be leaving the White House and has a gig lined up with MSNBC? Oh, God, I hope that's not true. Yeah. I hope that's not true. Well, it was Say reported that's not in the true. New York Times. The red... so. 
<laughs> no, I think I saw that actually on CNN, but yeah. I mean, she wanted to just go make more money. Like, wh- why wouldn't she do that? I yeah. mean, given you given that choice, Jennifer, I'm going to offer you a lot of money to, to go to MSNBC. Would you go? Of course you would. No, wait a minute. You don't know I'd, I'd do that. I may, I may, I may. <laughs> well, Jennifer, you're articulate and you have red hair. Maybe uh, there's a job for you at the White House. I'm thinking there might be an opening. Yeah. I'm thinking yeah. this might be my in. <laughs> what? <laughs> and all you, all you have to do it is for a year or two, and then you'll get a job at uh, MSNBC. That's okay. That's all right. Path. I'll give him a call. <laughs> I'll give him a call. I didn't hear that. I mean, I enjoy her. I did see um, another. They had someone else out yesterday because uh, she has COVID right now, right? I mean, she oh, was out she? with COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. she was out with COVID, so yeah. they have someone else there, and she looked a lot like Jen. So I thought, oh, <laughs> now maybe they're trying her out. <laughs> so I got to get in there fast. I have to. I got to get my audition tape together. And you already have the gen. So it's like I have the gen. Yeah. I have the red hair. So it wouldn't be that hard for the you know all Americans to shift. It you have the gen, and, and your last name starts with a P. Her last yeah. name starts with a P. I'm telling yeah. you, this is they, this they is. barely have to change the name on the door. <laughs> you just have to pronounce your name Ederson and, and yeah. not have the, the P be silent, <laughs> and then you're fine. It'll work, it'll work. So, uh, what have you guys been watching this week? Mark and I spent several days watching way more television than any two human beings should be watching. But uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. I'm just wondering, Joe, Jen, mm-hmm. is there anything that's uh, caught your fancy? Oh my gosh. Well, I just finished the third season of Afterlife. Ricky Gervais, um, you know, he writes and directs the show. It's the third season. He knows just when to end a series. He did the same thing with the original office. You know, he just knows he doesn't drag things out. So this was a perfect, it's just a beautiful show. Do you guys watch it? Have you ever seen Afterlife? I have I've, not yet. I've seen a few episodes, but yeah. it, it didn't grab me. Uh, I liked his performance, but there was something about it that was, for some reason, a little too sad for me. Yeah. Oh, we'll give it. Well, yeah, his characters tend to be kind of sad. Like Derek mm. was, was a sad character too, but but really profound. And give it a try because there's lots of joy in it. And it's life affirming, um, beautiful writing, lots of good laughs. You know, I can't say enough about it. And a really great series. Also a third series I'm watching uh, called Better Things, which is on FX. And that's Pamela Adlon, whom I think is just fantastic. I just love her. I've always loved her. And I think that this is, you know, if if the Emmys are really going to give like best actress for a series, I think they should look at better things than Pamela because she's she nails what it's like to be at a certain age in Hollywood single. She gets it right. I'm going to bring up something that's really not topical at all, just because Uh I want to talk about it. What could be less topical than comparing the two West Side Story uh, films? Because of, you know, this would have been a good conversation to have in late December, but I'm getting to it now at uh, the beginning of April. (laughs) (laughs) Springtime. Love is in the air. So Mark and I, one of the things that we did when we were hanging out together this past week was we had each watched uh, the original, excuse me, the 2022 version of West Side Story. And we went back together to watch the original, which we're both big fans of and compared them. Mm-hmm. And uh, we are both very much in Camp 1961 about this issue. It's, in our opinion, a far superior film. I'm wondering whether Joe and Jennifer, whether you've seen the new one and if you have anything to weigh in on this issue. I unfortunately am not cultured enough. I have never seen West Side Story. You've never seen the original? I have not. Oh, my gosh. Okay. No, I'm disappointed. You need, you need to watch both the first. Now you have to do it. You have to. And after you hear my take on it, you'll really want to. Um, full dis- uh, disclaimer, one of my film mentors was Robert Weiss, the original. Oh, the director, wow. The original one. Wow. So I was going, yes. So I was studying film in the Bay Area, and I was so in love with West Side Story, the movie, and Sound of Music that I wrote him a letter. And he invited me down to L.A. and uh, not a, in a creepy way. I literally went into his office and we had a meeting where he just wanted to hear about my goals as a director and writer. And he gave me some great wisdom. We stayed in touch, you know, when I went to AFI. Um, so he was a great man. So, of course, um, I am going to uh, lean towards the original And I love that film so much. And I do think it's a far superior one. I think, though, that if I had never seen that movie and I had just gone into Spielberg's West Side Story, because I also did a lot of musical theater. So I actually performed in that 
that musical as well. Oh, well. So I know, I know it really well. And um, I think if I had never seen the original, I would have thought, oh, this is fabulous dancing, beautiful music, lacking chemistry between Tony and Maria. But no, I mean, to me, there's just no comparison. I'm sorry. And I love Steven Spielberg. I mean, hello. I've seen Jaws a hundred times. I've seen most of his movies a hundred times. So, so I got to ask you, I got to ask you, since you brought it up, what part did you play? Oh, I was a dancer, singer. I was a shark. I That's very not politically correct now. <laughs> this is like, I, I mean, I was a Puerto Rican. So I had to yeah. darken my hair and I had to, because my strength was dance and singing, but no, I wasn't. The- well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that's something that I wanted to talk about, which is a big knock, if there is to, a knock to be made on the original, is that it wasn't politically correct because a gringo, Natalie Wood, played mm-hmm. Maria. So let's speak to that issue. And also a lot of people knocked her performance because it's famously known that the final soundtrack did not include her voice. Marnie so Nixon. Marnie, Marnie Nixon, Nixon. That's right. Mm-hmm. Who, who actually was well known as a ghost singer uh, mm-hmm. back in the 60s and 70s. But let's speak to those two points. I did a little research this week out of curiosity and found out Rita Marino did not sing all of her soundtracks in the movie. The, the very dramatic song that they sing after the rumble. Oh, a boy no, like that, he'd kill your brother. No. Mm-hmm. A, a boy mm-hmm. like that, he'd kill your brother. What's a, a, one of your own kind? Whatever the title of that is, she did not sing that. Yeah. I mean, she sung it on stage. She sung it on the set. And they had another singer dub her voice to that and a couple of the other songs in the movie. So people only knock Natalie Wood for them not using her soundtrack. Also, Russ Tamblin who was a fine actor, fine dancer, and mm. actually quite a, um, a gymnastic dancer. Several of his songs were actually recorded, and they used the, the track from one of the other actors in the movie, actually. Um, the guy that played Ice, and I'm blanking on his name, but he actually recorded the Jet song, When You're a Jet. So it's very unfair to Natalie Wood, rest her soul, that she got that rap. Yeah. They, they hit her because, of course, she, she wasn't a Latina playing a Latina. But I did a little research and I found out that um, several of the sharks were not of uh, Latino or, uh, you know, Mexican descent or, excuse me, Cuban descent. And uh, Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican descent. Or well, because they would of- cast, then they would just can't, they would cast based on the strength of the dancer. Right, because, right. Because, you have to. Because those characters, the, the sharks are insanely great dancers. So when you're casting the original film, that's what they were thinking about. Of course. And, of course. and uh, but you I know. also found out that this interesting little tidbit, do you know that no one in either of the two gangs was actually a juvenile delinquent? <laughs> they just cast regular people to play juvenile delinquents. Can you believe that? No, that's shocking. As if they could not find juvenile delinquents in Hollywood. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they also weren't teenagers and they're supposed to be teenagers. I think they were in their thirties or something. I mean, you know, look, look for me, the original West side story, when Tony and Maria first see each other, that's one of the most beautiful scenes I think ever captured in film. It's just haunting. It's just so perfect. What they, how he slows it down. And the, it's just so beautiful. And, you know, I didn't know how Spielberg was going to do it. I thought, you know, he, he did it differently and it wasn't, I, I thought, wow, okay, that one wasn't a special. So I was, that's how I was, unfortunately I was kind of watching it. And it was really, I'm sure it was tough for Spielberg to take it on, but I think the dance sequences, I was appreciative because as with, as a dance background, sometimes you'll watch musicals and you won't be able to see feet a lot of the time. It drives me nuts. And I was able to see the dancing in Spielberg's version as well. But um, yeah. Natalie Wood, I never, ever thought of Natalie Wood as not pulling off that role. I felt oh, like I she, she was terrific. Did. Yeah. And and I remember I know I remember because the same thing with Audrey Hepburn when she did My Fair Lady because Marnie Nixon sang for her as well and I know Audrey Hepburn really wanted to sing that part and she didn't get to but she ended up I think winning the Oscar for that if I'm not mistaken I think she did but I just think Natalie was just amazing in that role so you know yeah I mean you have to start thinking how far can can an actor go away from themselves so does everybody have to play somebody that's like them like you know, no one can see this, but Jennifer has red hair. Can you only play redheads? I mean, it can get that ridiculous. I mean, non-Jewish people play Jewish people. Russians have played non-Russians. What's the difference? They're acting. If they can pull it off, what's the difference? I agree. Um, 
And as a matter of fact, it's more challenging. You say, well, gee, that person's not even disabled and they're playing a disabled person. Now it's like only disabled people can play disabled people. It's like, Jennifer, I think you hit it succinctly. It's like, you really have to cast the best dancer. And I'll just use that metaphorically. You just mm-hmm. got to cast the person who can dance the best. And, yeah. that, and, it, and if you don't do that, then what's the point anymore? Then what's the point of acting? Yeah, go ahead, Joe. And not all Latinos, you know, look traditionally Latino. One of my co-hosts on the Where Can Fans podcast, he's half Puerto Rican. And if you looked at him, you would assume he's Irish. White mm-hmm. guy, red hair. But, you know, Puerto Rican. So you can't always judge. But I mean, where we're getting in culture, you do want to be more like better represented in films because, I mean, white people have had it for so long that God, how what was it less than 100 years ago? We had white people playing Chinese people. Yeah, yeah, and like <laughs> not re- not remotely. Passive. Well, Mickey Rooney and Breakfast Mickey at Rooney. Tiffany's. <laughs> Mickey yeah. Rooney. That's the classic one where when you're watching the movie Breakfast at Tiffany's and everything's going great until he shows up. Yeah, and, yeah. and then it's just like, oh my god, I can't believe that. That, that one is a little watching. embarrassing. Okay, I want to circle back to something Jen said, which was paying homage to Robert Weiss, who mm. I agree with you did a brilliant job directing the first. West Side Story also had to, as I'm sure you know, Jen, step in and choreograph some of the dance scenes when the producers let Jerome Robbins go Mm -hmm. because he was too much of a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. So he was even, you know, directing dance scenes that he had no training to do. And frankly, everybody gives Jerome Robbins, who is and was a dance genius. There's no doubt about that. But they give him credit for all of the choreography in West Side Story. And frankly, I think Robert Weiss borrowed from the play in those scenes that that he directed, but he did some of the choreography himself. But, well, uh, <laughs> and, and I mean, and to give Spielberg his, you know, props, I mean, he's shown time and time and time and time and time again that he's an incredible filmmaker. And he I think of Schindler's List and all the crazy and the incredible cinematography in that film. And, you know, Saving again, Robert Jaws, Robert. because yeah. how many times I mean, no one had done what he did with Jaws. I just didn't find anything in West Side Story where I was like, wow, I've never seen that before. That's incredible. Yeah. Where yeah. I guarantee you the first West Side Story, when that when that opened in the theaters and people went, they'd never seen anything like that before. And, and that just was- watching it again just the other just a few days ago, it was just as fresh to me. I saw that when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen it in 20, 30, 40 years. It was just as fresh, just as vibrant. Mm-hmm. Nothing seemed dated. I loved it. I loved it all over again as mm-hmm. an adult. And I hadn't seen it since I was, you know, a kid or a young person. So, so Joe, your know. homework for the week to come. <laughs> yeah, Joe. So guess what you're watching this weekend? <laughs> not not to I talk about first, the show. Though. I just want you to have that in your mm. cultural reference. Watch the what do you, he just asked which one should he watch first? What do you guys think? I think the original, right? The original. Watch the original yeah. first. Yeah. Yeah, you have yeah, because that's the way it was created. But also let's not pile on Joe. No, no. Well, that's funny. I was going to ask Kevin to review night one of WrestleMania for me and I'll watch West Side Story for him. If Haystacks Calhoun ain't in it, I ain't watching it. I love it. (laughs) So with that, we really should wrap it up. We've gone a little longer than we anticipated. I want to thank all three of you for being here. Uh, Joe, as always, thanks for being here. You, You really helped carry the show. Mark, always a pleasure having you on. Do you want to plug anything? Yeah, I want to plug Joe's WrestleMania and uh, whatever Jennifer's doing with her podcast. I think it's great. And uh, you should all listen to uh, Kevin's podcast as well. So those are my plugs. Yeah, Jennifer, what do you want to (laughs) plug again? There you go. WrestleMania, of course. Um, (laughs) uh, My my podcast, And Justice for Animals, if you care about the environment. And you love animals as much as I do, tune in. I think you'll enjoy it. Lots of great guests there. And that's about it right now. Working on some projects, but a little too early to to announce them. Great. And I want to plug, I've been talking about my first novel, Super Vows, for the last couple of weeks on the show. But I actually finally pulled the uh, trigger on publishing my second novel. It's called Pas de Deux, which is a French phrase meaning dance of two. It's about a ballerina and her journey from uh, the ballet schools of of Toledo, Ohio, through some competitions that launched her into a professional ballet career and her subsequent career after ballet and uh, where she meets and falls in love with a television comedy writer. Where do you you think I came up with that idea? 
I think it was from all of your years as a being a ballerina. Yes. <laughs> that's I didn't exactly even know right. that about you, Kevin. We have this yeah. dance thing in common. Yes. Yeah. You yeah. Him absolutely. In, in tights and a tutu. It's 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 extraordinary. So oh, yes. So if you want awesome. to know about my journey as a young female ballerina in the <laughs> 70s, 80s, and 90s, go look for Pas de Deux. It's on Amazon. You got to search it with my last name. Otherwise, you're going to find seven or eight other books with the same title. (laughs) So with that, I want to thank everybody for being here. So uh, as I always end every podcast, Greg, what will you be doing this week? Oh, that's right. He's not here. (laughs) Uh, I guess that we just have to say goodnight, everybody. Thanks for showing up. (laughs)